The RUSH protocol stands for Rapid Ultrasound in Shock and Hypotension. This protocol was described by Scott Weingart in the critical care literature in 2006 and is largely based on the FAST exam. It is by no means the only protocol there is for assessment of shock and hypotension with ultrasound, but it's the one that we tend to use and certainly the one that Mo and I will be demonstrating for you with some slight modifications. For the RUSH protocol, you have the option of choosing from three probes. For most of the RUSH protocol, we use the large curved probe, which we use for the abdominal examination, the lungs and the heart. If you have time, you can use the cardiac probe to get more detail with the cardiac examination. And then at any stage during the examination, if you need more superficial detail, you can use the linear probe. So we're about to commence the rush scan. We select the fast button on the Lumify uh, for this particular exam and we're using a cardiac probe, uh, which is quite useful for doing the whole exam. Uh, looking at lung window, so I've dropped the depth uh, to have a closer look um, at the lung windows. What you will notice is that uh, there's a typical ants crawling picture uh, up towards the top of the screen. Uh, there are some occasional bee lines coming through, they're less than three, so that's uh, less of a worry. At this point I tend to put M mode through uh, and that gives me an idea of whether there's the presence of air or not. Uh, this is the normal uh, beach wave pattern coming through. You can freeze that uh, and take a snapshot which gives you an idea uh, or documents that this is all normal. At that point I then slide inferiorly and we're just making sure that there is ongoing pleural sliding. We're looking for signs of bee lines uh, which gives us an indication that there's interstitial fluid present. Coming down that all looks fairly normal. Uh, the same thing, I can see good lung sliding uh, anteriorly here. I'll put M mode and the M mode tracing shows the typical beach pattern. If you freeze and take an image to document. So that's all normal up there. Sliding down You can see the heart beating and if you actually look at the pleural sliding here you might see what's known as a heart pulse, uh, that's normal, running from superior to inferior, heading down and again that all looks fine. So this is the parasternal long axis. What you can see uh, on this view uh, quite clearly is the right ventricle anteriorly, uh, behind it is the aorta and behind that is the left atrium. As a rough rule of thumb, they should be about a third uh, of the width of the, uh, the heart at that point. So I'll just see if I can get a, there we are, that's the standard view. Um, you can see that the aortic valves are closing in the midline. So again, uh, that's a useful piece of information. It suggests it's unlikely be, to be bicuspid, but you do need a different view. Uh, the mitral valves opening quite well with the anterior leaflet hitting the septum. That tells me that ejection fraction is at least 35% or better. You're also looking to see if there's signs of uh, pericardial effusion. And certainly if there's signs of tamponade, what you might notice is that there will be diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, which is at the uh, top of the screen. The right ventricle being anteriorly uh, positioned. At this point, I tend to put M mode through. That's just another way of quickly seeing how effective the uh, contractions are at that point. And you can see that the uh, anterior leaflet is hitting the septal wall at that point. You can use this later on to measure uh, volume changes uh, to work out what's known as fractional shortening. And this will give you an idea of the contractility of the heart. Just on inspection, uh, ejection fraction here looks pretty good. It's probably about 60 to 65% which is normal. I'm going to try to see if we can get an apical four chamber view. I've got an apical four chamber view there. Now you can adjust uh, so that it fills the screen. 
and on this you can see the left ventricle uh, is greater than the right ventricle. The right ventricle is about two-thirds the size. Normal contractility. Uh, my attention is drawn to the interatrial septum and it's got a normal swinging pattern there which tells me that the diastolic pressures are okay. There's certainly no evidence of big regional wall motion abnormalities there. And the heart contractility seems fine. Over here, uh, if you're able to, uh, you can just make out the heart there. Okay, and we can see uh, the RV up against the liver at this point. Rotate 90 degrees to get onto the IVC. So you can put M mode through here. Deep breath in. See if we can find the aorta. So that's the aorta there. Uh, pulsating. Uh, the key to this is to actually press into uh, the probe um, head um, that's closest to the xiphysternum deep so that you can uh, have a look at the aorta in plane. Uh, that all looks fine. I'll just drop the depth so we can interrogate it better. There doesn't seem to be any obvious ectasia of the aorta at this point. Uh, you can actually freeze and take a measurement. This particular case, this is around 1.6 centimeters, which is normal, and you can see that it's uh, uh, the same all the way through. Then going into the axial view, I can now trace the aorta down in front of the spinal column, following it through, and here it enlarges and starts to bifurcate. Moving down, we're looking at the bladder. There you go, so that's the bladder. Uh, what we want to do is scan uh, from top heading inferiorly, and we're looking for free fluid behind the bladder. Then go into the longitudinal axis, and we want to fan to the patient's right, fanning to the patient's left, and we're looking for fluid behind the bladder, of which there is none here. But there is the vesicorectal pouch, which is a potential space, and where fluid can collect in a recumbent patient. We're looking to find the kidneys, which we've got here on view. Deep breath in. Breathe away. The important thing here is to make sure we get the tip of the kidneys in view as well. There's certainly no free fluid there. I tend to rotate here and scan through the kidney as well from top to bottom. Moving on, we're looking at the left kidney. Looking at the spleno-renal angle. The key to looking at the left kidney is to actually ultrasound with your hand against the bed. And you can see the kidney on the left here. So the inferior pole is seen quite clearly. We're looking to see if uh, there's evidence of free fluid there. So by now, uh, the cause of the hypertension would probably be fairly self-evident if you followed through the RUSH protocol. However, it is useful to summarize the different types of, of shock and shock states that you're looking for. So there are about four states that we're looking for specifically. So there's hypovolemic shock, distributive shock, obstructive shock, as well as cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock refers primarily to a pump issue, and so the heart is not working very well. So often what you'll find is that there is poor contractility of the heart. There will be a large non-collapsing IVC as evidence of a right heart failure. And with left heart not pumping well enough, you might notice that there will be lung rockets and a pleural effusion on the lung windows. When you're examining the pipes of the large vessels, we would expect those to be normal. Hypovolemic shock, on the other hand, has loss of volume, so this is primarily a tank or a pipe issue. Therefore, the heart will be trying to compensate. What you will notice is that there will be a hyperdynamic heart that is present. There may be a small or collapsing IVC, 
because there is lack of fluid within the actual system. And what you may also notice, there may be evidence of a AAA or dissection when you're actually inspecting the pipes. In the case of distributive shock, sepsis is the uh, most common cause of this, and this is primarily because of vasodilation. The heart may try to compensate early by being quite hypercontractile or hyperdynamic. However, as part of the sepsis, as it progresses, that contractility may decrease. What you will notice is that the IVC may be normal or slightly decreased if there is concomitant dehydration. And examination of the large vessels in this particular case will also be normal. Finally, with obstructive shock, if this is due to a pneumothorax with tension, you would see evidence of this on your lung windows with a large pneumothorax being present and hypotension being present as well. If this is due to a pulmonary embolism, what you may notice is that there would be the presence of clots, especially on your parasternal short axis view, uh, where you have a view of the right ventricular outflow tract, or you might see that the right ventricle is actually enlarged. The other cause of obstructive shock is pericardial tamponade, and what you may notice is that there would be diastolic collapse of the right ventricle at that point. This concludes our RUSH protocol. We hope you found this presentation useful for managing your patients. Thank you for your attention.